Hey, welcome to the 384th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patron Ben Steer. I'm Matt Lowe. And I'm Warren Kaplan. And today we are talking about the struggle and the hustle of being a filmmaker. Don't rewind. This isn't a, a replay of an old episode. It's just a replay of what's going on in our minds every day uh, this year. I saw some article in the LA Times about the struggle of being an actor in Hollywood. I feel like it's relatable to people. And right now we are in the midst of a, a do you call it the strike or do you call it like a double strike? Like, do you, do you talk about it strike. as strikes? No, no, I call it the strike. I think SAG joined the WGA in the strike again. Even though they are asking for different things and might yeah. be resolved separately. Differently. Like, yeah, will yeah. most likely be resolved separately. Yeah. One of as the big we're things. recording, it's day 100 of the strike, which is. Oh, yeah notable for two reasons one 100 is a nice round number but two that's how long the previous wga strike lasted so we are oh, officially 2008 in the 2008 strike it was 100 days yeah and also if memory serves and it may not but we kind of knew by like day 97 98 that like 100 was going to be the day that it was over like we we, mm. had, we get sense in the wind that like Negotiations were, go, were going well mm. and all that. And like the exact opposite is happening for us currently. So, yeah, but I do think like part of the strike is uh, just opening everyone's eyes. I, I actually don't know if the rest of the world cares, but it's definitely opening up Angelino's eyes to how much hustling and how much struggling like all the people in the arts do. And I saw like, Billy Porter like has to like get rid of yeah. his house. Yeah, and he's like a genuine celebrity that broke out big and is doing big things. Has and multiple couldn't. shows. Yeah, the jobs went away basically because of any because of the strike. Yeah, and I had a had lunch with a friend yesterday. They got laid off because the studios are, you know, trying to pay less people, uh, even on on the inside. So, uh, yeah. So I, it just kind of reminded me about our own struggles and hustles. And I think a lot of people will relate to definitely to the hustle. Um, and, and obviously, you know, those words are somewhat interchangeable. I think to me, like a hustle is more about just like you working your ass off and a struggle is just something that you wish you, uh, had a, a better way of dealing with. Yeah. The, the hustle is like you're striving and the struggle is you're coping maybe. Yeah. I like that. Um, but before we pop into talking about that, I, I was curious if you felt like the strike, the writers and the actor strike is affecting you. I, I was in what ways it's affecting you like on a day to day basis. Yeah. It's pretty tangible for me and my family because, uh, my wife is an actor and her side hustle is an, as an actor coach for working professionals. And so. All right. Does she do mainly kids or does she also do yeah, adult he, actors? Yeah, yeah, kids and young adults and yeah, plenty of adults as well. But yeah, like kids is an area of expertise for sure. She's been doing it for a long time and it's been a really nice, it's like an ideal job for an actor. You have, you know, like if you need to give a whole class because of an audition, everyone gets it and it makes you more valuable, you know? Um, and right. uh, you'd rather get advice from a working actor, from a working than, actor than not yeah. than non-working actor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it's been really a, a a wonderful gig, but it is very seasonal. It's tied to whether people are are auditioning or not. And she has regular clients and classes that she teaches and all of that. But um, between it being slow in the summer, pretty typically, and that also no one having audition. Uh, our income is dipped pretty significantly, you know, and yeah. um, you forget how much you need money. <laughs> you <know? laughs> I don't. Yeah. You're like, oh, wait. Yeah. And I am noticed this. We feel it in a very tangible way. I haven't felt this broke in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's weird. I think the other thing people don't realize that much is the side hustles of even like the working people in Hollywood. Like if I think. You hear of actors being like servers or right, like the slashers. Like I'm a server slash partner. It's like I work catering. I do valet and, and then I act. But I feel like that has like a 
an element of like, I just moved to Hollywood and I'm the trying parent, to ma- make it for the first couple of years. Yeah. You don't realize um, that's at this point, that's most actors have to have right. some other form of income. Right. I think Even most working, actors, working actors, I should think, yeah, you know. but I think a lot of them like kind of graduate from the server valet catering mode and do like what, you know, your wife does. Like she has, she right. teaches other actors how to audition. I mean, we know actors that put other actors on tape. We know people that do all sorts of coaching. We know directors that write treatments for other directors, right? Like, uh, I do visual effects on the side, uh, for other filmmakers. So I think there, there is this, like when we're all competing for like a limited number of jobs, we all have to have other jobs that are supporting even the people that we're up against because that's kind of how the machine of Hollywood works, right? Like not everyone gets to be a director or an actor. A lot of people have to be supporting the support staff of them. And so if your side job is as a support staff person in some way, then you can survive. But when the entire industry shuts down, that part gets really difficult. Warren, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Whenever things are really dry, you often will hear from reps or the two you're working with, but like the A-lister who wow. normally are shooting movies and TV shows and kind of moonlight in the commercial world um, are gobbling up those jobs that they would normally be too busy to take. And therefore the people who are, you know, maybe not household names, but uh, normally do those jobs end up taking the lower tier jobs and that it kind of trickles down. And so like when we're in near mid to upper tier directing gigs, it gets a little scarce because celebrities are, are now taking the job that your competition, whether it's, you know, I'm pitching against David Fincher. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Who would never be pitching on this who, job. Who would just be busy otherwise. Yeah. 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 Um, Yeah, so I was actually afraid of that happening. And from what I've seen, it hasn't happened that much. I think it could be because I work in this budget level where uh, some of these directors like would just rather not work than than figure out how to make a commercial for a certain amount of money um, or with like less support staff than they're used to. I've found it, it interesting is like, the thing, the way I've been most affected, you know, working primarily in commercials is that I am just having so many people reach out to me. So, yeah. so many people, yeah. <clears throat> directors, DPs, editors, composers. And I, deep... I, I, I want to say, I love all of the people that we work with. It's mm-hmm. truly, a, and I want to help them and want only the best for them. It's a little triggering. Anytime you get a text from a person like, like I worked with seven years ago. That's like, hey man, it's really rough out there. Anything going on? It boy, it makes me so sad. Because they're talented. I want them to work. And also it's just a, a reminder that like it's kind of dire out there. Yeah. I mean, I I feel like for me, like I I'll get a lot of texts that are like, hey, Oren, you know, saw you did this project on Instagram. Like, would love to grab coffee. Like, love your style. And I'm like, okay, you're the DP that like for the last 12 projects told me you have absolutely no time to like even talk to me, you know? So it's like on one hand, I'm excited to maybe have access to these DPs and editors and composers and production designers that I normally wouldn't. I might have a shoot tomorrow and the production designer is like incredible and I've been trying to work with him. He's been recommended to me for like years and he's never, ever, ever been available. Big TV, like Emmy winning TV production designer now he's doing this tiny thing for me tomorrow so i think that's cool but um but i'm getting like a lot of directors reaching out to me recently <laughs> i don't know if you are too but it's like a little hey, bit yeah how yeah. do i get in this commercial game like can you recommend any production companies that you yeah. think would be a good fit for me and i'm like uh i i could maybe sit down and do some work and help you figure out what's right for you uh but also, like, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to be competing with you. I don't want to, like, bring you into my world, especially if you do kind of similar things to me, to be, like, extra competition. And I'm, like, working hard to pitch you. Yeah. And I also, like, 
yes, you made an awesome movie. You made an awesome t- episode of TV. You made an awesome, this awesome. Like, I, I'm trying to find my own angles of like why I think people should hire me. Like, I don't want to be responsible for your your angle, you know? Yeah, I think that's true. I think it's also like, we've talked about this a lot, off and on the mic. You have to love commercials to be good at it, you know? So there's a little bit of like, you know, I think there's a mentality from actors and directors and everybody, but where it's like, well, I, I'll, I'll make my living in commercials and do my art on this. I'll do theater to make me happy in commercials to pay the bills. And it's like, well, yeah, that's, that's true in a certain sense. You know, that was true for me for a long time. But also you have to love commercials in order to book them in the first place. Like it's too yeah. competitive otherwise. Yeah. It's also just a super different skill to pitch and win a commercial job that I don't know that feature directors and TV directors are really great at unless it's like the exact right commercial for them. It's uh, interesting. But overall, I mean, my wife is also an actor at 1000%, like all the theatrical auditions have basically disappeared i know there's some indie films that are going but they're it's become very competitive because they can basically get any actor they want now (laughs) because everyone's available so it's harder you know at a non-famous level to be getting a lot of auditions And, and i think people are still scared even in the indie film world you know of like something happening or being shut down or not getting the waiver from sag or whatever it's a big risk um so anyhow the strike i'm hoping it ends soon uh you said might not end until next year yeah i mean the iot um renegotiation if i'm sure the kind of the next big hurdle though you know i know that like like a lot of the i don't know what you call them reports basically announcements about how all of the different corporations are doing came out just recently like netflix at the time about their you know, numbers and Disney and all those places. And yeah, the earnings reports, the earning report. Thank you. Uh, because they're not spending money on making things, you know, they've got this kind of inadvertent cash flow that's keeping their numbers healthy, but like that's going to dissipate relatively quickly. Hopefully I have a resolution to all this. So fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Until then it's a uh, mac and cheese for me, baby. Until then, your only form of new entertainment is the Just Shoot It podcast. <laughs> Make sure to tell your friends if you want to support us. Uh, check out Patreon, patreon.com slash Just Shoot It Pod. It's where you can throw us a buck, two bucks, four bucks, 20 bucks, $2,000 a month to help the podcast go. It's 100% uh, voluntary and your money is literally just going to pay our editor, our server fees and all those things. And we really, really do appreciate it eight years nine years i have no idea how long we've been doing this but longer than everyone else except for the script notes guys i'll admit that thank you patreon.com slash just shoot a pod we really appreciate it kaplan hit us with the struggle yes so my first struggle is about post-production I feel like I am working really hard in pre-production, really hard on scripts, really hard on figuring out the right crew, the right cast, all the stuff, production, shooting, fighting for things, the lenses and the cameras and the angles and the performances. And I'm getting to the first cut and I'm like getting an okay edit and I feel like it's promising and I give some notes and then I am just struggling with everything else going on in my life the kids and the trips and summer and camps and you really have been out of town for like a month and a half i feel like i've been doing a lot of traveling this summer and i just feel like i'm struggling to keep up on post-production and i told you this before we started recording but i feel like if i did half the number of jobs and spent twice the amount of time on each job that from a career standpoint, I would be farther because I feel like I'm just killing myself to get jobs and to yes. shoot, shoot yes. them and fighting so hard to get the next job, you know, and it, as you all know, a lot of times you have to fight over and over and lose and lose and lose until you win. But 
in the midst of those struggles to get the next job, I'm letting the post-production fall by the wayside and I'm not getting final cuts that I love, that I want to put on my website, that I want to like blast on Instagram, that I want to like show the world. And I remember when I made my feature, I think this is potentially a good lesson to the one person out there that doesn't realize this, but sometimes you, when I made my feature, I I was working full-time for Disney and I, I took like two months off to go to New York to shoot the movie um, again, killed myself. I put in like a ton of my own hard earned money into it. It was just like a, a real passion project, labor of love. And I went, I finally had to go back to work cause I had to like make money again to like survive. And I remember my, I told my boss at the time, Mike, I was like, Mike, I, I'm, I'm having a real hard time, like working on the edit while working at Disney and like trying, being, trying to be good at my job. I'm like, I don't know what to do. Like maybe I can work like four days a week and take one day off. And he said, he's like, look, Orrin, I've seen this before. Like people do like 90% of the work, you know, they yeah. get the money, they get the script, they get this, they get that. They, and finally at the very end, right before the movie's done, like sure. they've Shit completely run out of steam. And, but that is yeah. actually the most important time to make something. And we know that we can take like mediocre footage and make an awesome edit, but it's equally easy or even way easier to take good footage and make a mediocre edit, uh, whether it's the color grade, whether it's the editing itself, whether it's, you know, the sound design or the music or whatever, I'm just really struggling to follow through on my project. And I feel like it's 2023, it's August where, and I have yet to, I've, I've shot a good amount of stuff this year, but I've yet to take something that I've shot this year and put it on my website because I just haven't you know, f- figured out how to follow through enough to get these things to be where I want them to be. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it, in prepping for this episode, we talked about the a tiny bit, but there's that element of the struggle. And then there's also the freelancer mentality that I think right now you really epitomize. It's not like if the jobs, if every job that you were taking paid twice as well, that you would do half as many. You'd still do them, just have more money socked away for when there's a draft, right? And so... Yeah, it's almost like not even about the money. It's about this thing, It might be slightly related to your struggle, that as freelance filmmakers, we feel like if we turn down an opportunity, they won't come back to us with more opportunities. So it's that fear of like, hey, Warren, would you be interested in hearing about this thing that like totally doesn't work for your schedule and isn't a good budget and is really hard and the creative's not good? You're on a vacation, like, you're on a submarine. I'm on vaca- yeah. Yeah, but like, uh, maybe you can talk to them about like timing the breach so that you guys are up for air and you'll get Wi-Fi <laughs> exactly. signal at the right time. My answer 100% of the time is like, sure, I'll check out the creative, send it to me, you know? And you're engaged, you know, no matter what. So, you know, obviously getting more jobs and getting paid more money is good when that works out. But it's more about the fear of saying no to opportunities uh, that are coming from certain people. Obviously, you know, some people it's easy to say, sorry, I don't have time to do this free thing for you or whatever. But when someone that you know might lead to other jobs offers you something, it's really, really hard to say no because we've seen it. We know it happens. You turn something down and they, they go to the next person and then that's and their then person they, from they now on. The person. Yeah, for sure. And we've been that person too. Uh, so yes, yeah, so that's my struggle. I'm curious if other people are, are thinking. I, I mean, I guess I would ask for advice, but it's just so obvious what it is, which is like, hey, just follow through on the post. <laughs> you know, I'm yeah. just like do the thing you're saying you're, you're yeah, struggling to do. Do the but... thing like, and pick your battles too, right? Like surrender if you know you don't have time for some of them. You know, there's like uh, a handful of jobs I can think of off the top of my head that are such a time commitment that if you followed through on them the way you want to, it would take the rest of your year, basically. Don't do those. Do the little ones, you know. But good luck. Godspeed. I get it. You know, it's really hard to like bust your butt and then not love the product in the end. And that it can be really, really frustrating. Yeah. And I have seen, you know, I went to the, the DGA had like the commercial directors that were nominated for best commercial of the year or whatever. And they, every single one of those directors does their own edit. 
they sit, they have, they bring their editor on and they sit with them and they spend weeks and they're in the grade and they're doing this. And I see like some of the other directors at art class that are like the kind of top directors on the roster. And they, I know they're just like micromanaging every frame of the edit. I mean, a commercial is like freaking 600 and, you know, 720 frames or something. <laughs> like, you need to micromanage every frame if you want it to be exquisite. <laughs> you got any struggles? You're just happy. You're just always happy. My struggle, uh, no, I'm like, you know, I, I don't have room to complain. That's true. Listeners will know I've got kind of three different lives happening. I'm show running for a podcasting network. I'm, um, I've got my commercial directing career. I also have an indie feature that's moving and grooving, uh, taking up a deep amount of my time, which is great. Um, and so no, again, no room to complain, but my commercial career. And you also have a side hustle building cowboy tubs and cowboy tubs bend bend over a minute, but yeah, I do have a new family and stuff as well. So, uh, and so like truly the zoo calls. You know, we got a Huntington Gardens uh, annual pass. We kind of get our money's worth on that. It's great. But like, yeah. You're like, you are mean the literal zoo. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, but the your point being like, uh, my personal life, my my family life, it's a little more time consuming than I had, but I just love to be here to kind of like, do your own thing, you know, all of that. So, uh so with that many plates spinning, it's something you gotta give. I didn't nurture my commercial career as much as I would have liked. I'm not hustling as hard on that. And so as a result, I'm not shortlisting like I used to. And that's pretty frustrating. And, you know, I'm in that situation where my life is leveled out pretty well. Like it would be great to go shoot that thing for two female every month. Right. I'm not, I don't need it, but it would be really nice. And there are muscles that I don't get to use otherwise in the rest of my life. Right. Now. And so I can feel my reel getting a little older. I've got recent work that I'm really proud of, but you can see, I'm the guy looking look at your career. I look at like how things are going for you. I know boards are coming in now, commercials are bad. And it's like, you know, you just, I was in the mix because there's that over this weekend and it felt really good to like, just right. be like, and just to oh. be, just to clarify for our listeners, when you say you're in the mix is you were on a list of directors that were being shown to an agency to potentially pitch on a project. And this was something where it was like a little bit further. I, I've been pitching, not, I've been in the mix, quote unquote, on lots of things. I was close on one. I was like, not officially shortlisted, but it felt imminent, you know, like we were talking to companies about putting together a bid and like it was further down the line than it had been in a minute. I just, and again, re- just to remind people shortlisted means that you are being considered to direct something. It, and, and you're one of likely three finalists, basically like you, you yeah. pass the first couple check Heard marks. So yeah. Yeah. Like it, it's the odds are one in three not one in a thousand right right so you're saying there's a chance yeah exactly and like i said it felt it felt good to just be like thinking about oh look who would i hire for this how do we put together the team i'm texting you to be like hey what producer do you know in new york or whatever you know all of that stuff um that i hadn't done you know in a couple months and yeah uh there's like that, we're going to get the band back together excitement yeah, from yeah. every, every new potential project. Yeah. yeah. And, and look, I shot a, a great campaign, you know, in January where I got to work with a lot of people that I really love. So like, I am it's not like I toured that long ago with that band, so to speak, but still, you know, it was like, uh, just a different part of my life and it felt familiar. And I think maybe now that I don't. I'm saying it out loud. There is the, the personal angle of like, my life has changed very much. You know, like I live in a different part of town. I've got a baby. 
you know, go out, out after 7 p.m. and less special circumstance. So like, but the thing I miss more than like going to dinners or concerts or movies is, is shooting. You know, I have a, a regular life now. And um, so getting a taste of like, oh, a calf job would be a pod and who do I bring with me and all that stuff. Uh, got me excited for a second. Yeah. So the struggle is is figuring out like how to update your reel while doing balancing all the yeah, other things. Yeah, yeah. I think it's like how do you keep all of the plates spinning metaphorically and specifically how do you stay relevant in every aspect of your career, right? And I and I think this is maybe surprisingly more relatable than I seared. <laughs> you go away, you go make a movie. And then mm -hmm. your TV career falls by the wayside until the movie comes out, which takes a while. Or, mm -hmm. you know, like, I think people have these problems as working directors when they're taken off for a big project, whether it's a personal project or a big life project, or frankly, just a lull in a certain part of their business, you know? Yeah. I think there's three things. I know you're not asking me for advice, but three ideas. Yeah. Number one. You'll never do. I would never do. Horrible idea. I'm just putting it out there for okay. the listeners. Did you shoot a spec commercial? Number two, more likely you, f you fake your own death. I wouldn't do that. As sure. <laughs> uh, I love faking my own death. And that got just so many extra passports lying around. You fake your own death. You leave your family for two months. You don't, mm -hmm. don't even worry about attending the funeral and seeing who shows up or anything. You're just working nonstop, you know. 17 hours a day on your jobs you're doing your main job you're doing a side job you're whatever <laughs> you're you're pretending you're like a 22 year old person again and living that lifestyle for a couple months uh just improving your <laughs> like like <laughs> handling spinning all the plates um or number three which we talked about and it, this is a job into unto its own but it's i think slightly more manageable and you started doing it you there was a blip of you doing this and then you you stopped <laughs> and i've been really bad about doing this too recently but it's the social media thing sure it's yeah the if you aren't making a new thing to show people if you don't have a new short film or a new vimeo staff pick or a new trailer for your movie or episode no. of whatever pilot script or a commercial but you're you've got these plates spinning uh, and you're posting like, hey, look at this is how we're breaking down the script on my show I'm show running. You know, this is how we do location scouts. This is how we do this. Is you're, I think, at least reminding people that you to think of you when thinking of filmmaking. And I think it it aids. It's you know, it's a little different in the commercial world. Like a lot of it is about your reel, but I do think if you're pitched. You're like, not wrong. You're not wrong. I, I think there is a little bit of like, you almost, I almost need four accounts. I need the account of just my family. I need the account of my feature. I need the account of my commercial. I mean, like have my show running because like, I guess I get a little apprehensive of like, oh, like Matt, you're, you're off running the show. This is crazy. That's cool. Congratulations. Uh, I guess we can't. We shouldn't send you this pitch for this commercial that shoots in Brazil. Do you know what I mean? Do you ever get apprehensive about that? No, I think I think a hundred percent of the time work begets work, and when people think you're busy, they and you have some availability for them, mm -hmm. then they feel like they're lucky they that lucky. they got you. No, you're right. And you're right. and the thing that you obviously could always drop is like the family, like that's like <laughs> not. You're not literally no, leave right. your family. Why do you think I have this um, pile of passports? Or no, the, what you the the social media for your family is like just for you and your friends, and it's fun and like I honestly like the Instagram on Instagram specifically. You have stories and you have posts, and to me, the stories is like, hey, I'm eating at this cool restaurant, um, or like I'm doing this location scout, and here's my kid on a scissor lift or whatever, and the posts are like hey, this is what I'm like interested in. This is like going to be f a forever thing on my social media. N not as important. You could just post like, hey, check out this cool camera yeah, move I sure, did. Sure, you know? sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
or like you know yuki dp buddy like it's just constantly just posting stories of like cool gear he's playing with, you know yeah yeah and just reminding people hey if you ever need this gear call me you know yeah yeah i know how to use got it i know how to use it yeah no i think that's right i think that's right i think it's a little bit of what uh, i hesitate to say time management but band book basically you know yeah my days fly by man it's it's so uh, we barely have time for this podcast it's that and it's the like today at 6 p.m i laid on the living room floor told my kids to stand on my back and it took a 20 minute nap <laughs> like just hard to even stay awake for you know like let alone go sit down and like write some great idea you know anyhow yeah well those are the struggles those are the struggles Oren, tell me about your hustle so my hustle obviously related to my struggle is that i feel like i'm constantly spending like all weekend trying to get jobs <laughs> um and uh i just went on vacation and on friday someone's like hey what do you think about these scripts and i basically had to spend all weekend thinking about these things talking about them pitching him looking up images looking up mm-hmm. videos mm-hmm. while you were out of town while i was like trying to relax at the pool you know with the family and i just like i'm just I feel like const- constantly just answering text messages, answering emails, trying to stay in the game. And uh and yeah, that's my my hustle for the week. And you know, there I, I think there's there's no answer to it unless you decide to say like, "Hey, here's my out of office email," <laughs> you know. Uh yeah, which I think you know one can do. Right. Like part of the reason why you have a team with this production company. So that like, you know, you can be a little bit, you still have to be as active, but like there were other people to answer for you. So you can be like, Hey, I'm out in town guys, field these emails, you know, for instance, easier said than done. And like, it's a symbiotic relationship. So you can't just like pass them the ball and expect them to like you know, run down the court, but, uh, yeah, usually it's, I'm emailing them. You know? Yeah. 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 But exactly. Yeah, it, it, it is like just this never ending hustle. Again, it's like another thing that in the strikes, you know, we've heard actors talk about putting themselves on tape and like <laughs> running to audition places, spending a hundred dollars on an audition, buying a new wardrobe, like setting up lights, doing all these things. And then it's like them against a hundred people. And then they decide, Hey, they're just going to offer the role to someone famous. Yeah. It's like the hustle. I mean, if you are a newer person trying to get into this business, just, just, I hope you enjoy the hustle. <laughs> yeah. Which is, I mean, honestly, I think like, look, I've known for you, known you for a long time now, like you do like it and like you are stressed by it and you would rather be able to turn it off when you want to someone I was working with worked with Seth Rogen pretty closely. And they said that he, you know, he's got the laugh, (laughs) you know, his like Seth Rogen, but he said that he's just like when they're working, he's like a hundred percent business. There's no chit chat. It's not like, Hey, Oh, like your shirt. That's cool. Like, what's it? How's it going? Where are you from? He's like, he's like, we get in the room and he's just like, okay, here's the idea. This doesn't work. This works. Let's do this. We're going to do that. And uh, let me know, just show me like what it looks like, you know, tomorrow. Um, And I just thought it was interesting because this guy that like you, like clearly one of the biggest stoners, most famous stoners in the world. It's like constantly high. But, but the fact that like, even this guy is just constantly at, you know, so far into his career where he's also probably one of the most successful producers in Hollywood right now. Yeah. Is just like, okay, here we go. Step one, step two, step three, like. There's yeah. no chill. <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah. It was interesting to me. What about you? You've got, you've yeah. been doing some hustling. The hustling. Part yeah. of the reason this episode might be a day late. Yeah, I think it, uh, it is. Um, yeah. So uh, as I mentioned before, the movie stuff is like um, kind of my front burner beside the day job. And, uh, you know, we've been sort of trepidatious about strike stuff and this and that. And um, now that waiver. Or, or rather, I should say, the infancy of the green bench, which is 
um, SAG offers a, basically a, a, a contract for people who are not affiliated with the AMTTP, um, wherein you can work with SAG actors again. And essentially the agreement is we as producers will give you everything that SAG is asking for and, or whatever we all ultimately agree on when the strike ends, basically. So like you'll get the deal that everyone else get, gets. And so that has empowered us to get out there, start making offers, you know, like that takes a lot of just time and brain space. And I've been waking up early and staying up late and, you know, taking meetings in a way that I hadn't before, uh, which is great and exhilarating, but, um, you know, we're just, again, spending all those plates for it. So hopefully, uh, this is the other category that, um, you didn't mention, but hopefully the prestige of a, any feature that does well at festivals means something to commercials as well. And I think it does. I think it does. I know you're, you're, you're pursing your lips in apprehension, but we certainly know, um, directors who are doing great. I mean, Jocelyn and Don, I think are doing great. I know they're doing great. Shout out intensely talented filmmakers. I think that greener grass, their hit indie film has a lot to do with that. Yeah. And I think you were talking about what happened last night. Yeah. I mean, I had to reschedule, reschedule an episode of the podcast with a guest I was very excited about because I had an investor in town that I wanted to like say hello to and reconnect with. And, you know, there's just a lot of relationships that you have to nurture, you know, you know, stay on your producers. You have to, uh, just put in that personal effort and, you know, it feels good. It's exciting. Um, but also, uh, to your point about being 22, it's like a little harder to, you know, drive across town, uh, when you've got a baby sticking in your front row. Like the interesting thing about the, the hustles and kind of how I look at them in, in terms of like the Hollywood hustle is that part of what makes them exhausting is that we just don't get paid for this hustle, you know? Like, I don't get paid to pitch on a job. You don't get paid to go dine and wine and investor, you know? On the flips, like, I, on the contrary, we're spending money, spending resources, spending time to go invest in these potentials. So, you know, we're kind of playing the odds, right? Like, you meet with three investors, you hope one invests. I pitch on three things, hope that yeah. one lands. I wish the odds were that good. That'd be great. Yeah, or maybe one in five, whatever it is. It's, uh, yeah, I, so it's that, that hustle is real. And again, it's like you and I have both been here for 20 years, you know, <laughs> like, and we're still, still hustling and God knows the actors, you know, like, I mean, a lot of my actor friends, to be honest, the, a few of them kind of made it and are doing okay, but most of them left the business. But when we were younger like i'd be like hey so are we going out to dinner or doing that thing or going to this party and they're like nope got an audition last minute audition got a, it's five pages got to rehearse you know sure how many like, how many vacations i mean come um early for or like dot self tape from wherever you were we've done a ton of self tapes like from all over the world and i'd love to hear about everyone else's hustles and struggles you know we did that episode about being overwhelmed and we got a lot of emails of people saying they can relate which um, I was happy about because, you know, again, we, we complain when we don't work and we complain when we do work. So I like that other people like to hear us complain. I like um, that you said we. That, uh, that, that's great. Uh, you're, you just do it in a way. You like try to paint it as not complaining. Uh, but, well, I think my complaining is about my life and your complaining is about my complaining. <laughs> <laughs> all right we're both Great. complaining in a certain way before we finish all of our complaining do you have a second to endorse something unpaid endorsements okay so my unpaid endorsement i think i like this one orin is a, a a youtube channel called cgy the letter cgy 
Um, and they are video essays on CG, basically. So, like, uh, I watched one just recently about, like, the the effects behind District 9 and why they're so good. Um, and so I think it's actually pretty helpful for a director who maybe doesn't endeavor to do the VFX themselves but wants to be more conversant. Certainly they're smart and thoughtful and like, you know, a cool lens to look at different films through. And it, it's pretty great. You know, I've, I always find like a video essay or a, a VFX tutorial with my two favorite ways to kind of decompress and play procrastinate and this combined them. So the YouTube channel CGY. Um, Kaplan, what you got, buddy? So I've actually endorsed this before and I've never used it. <laughs> um, but do you remember Soundly? I think I, t I mentioned it in the uh. podcast before. It's a site I've been really wanting to check it out and I think it's grown a lot. GetSoundly.com is this a platform for sound effects and music and things and you can search their giant library for a monthly subscription. You can even do like a 24 hour subscription. If you're just working on a project right now and you're just missing some sound effects, you can also use it to sort all your own sound effects that you own on, on a hard drive and put them all in one database. The, the biggest problem with sound effects is like searching them, right. And putting them all together. So it kind of does that for you. But again, I haven't used it, but I think it does some really intelligent things like AI stuff where you can be like a wolf howling and it will give you like wind whistling you know like oh cool things yeah. that are related mm -hmm. um that you might and, need uh, yeah yeah interesting yeah and also that um you might be able to like put sound effects yeah. in and it'll find you similar ones yeah. and things like that um but the reason i brought it up is because one of the edits i got from the editor or this thing i shot last week he had the temp vo in there and you know usually how do we do temp vo is like the editor mm -hmm. just records the voiceover or the assistant or something and it's usually pretty bad but i was like oh this temp vo is not bad and i had a suspicion but i it asked hurt. just to be sure and i was like where is this who recorded this temp vo it sounds pretty good and he was like oh i use sound lead ai generated oh, yeah yeah i was like wow this is like it's not like like i would definitely one million percent cast someone and do it just try to hit a, perform a slightly more interesting performance. But for temp, you cannot, it, like, it sounds as if I gave, like, a professional voice actor a script and they just read it. Maybe they right. didn't care about it and they're not, like, punching certain words and not other words. But it sounds like a normal human being reading words. And I know that this is part of what the problem is. But it was really impressive as, like, a tool for editors to temp things in and figure out the soundscape I haven't used it, but I know now quite a few like super pro editors that do work on big commercials and things that subscribe to it. So if it's something that you're interested in, they, they don't sponsor us or anything, but they are welcome to get soundly.com. Awesome. Uh, okay. If you want to find us, we're on uh, social media. I just shoot a pod. Are we, we got our threads account going yet. I'll work on that. I'll get that. We'll get it on Instagram great way to find us we're on twitter slash x if you want to tweet at us or post at us whatever it's called now but you can find us at just shoot a pod you can email us just shoot a pod at gmail.com we would love 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 to hear from you especially if as it pertains to any topic we talk about or topics you want us to talk about you can find me i'm on instagram at o kaplan and i'm at mr matt enlow across all social media including letterbox i might see you people have been signing up i appreciate it make it feel good the only good social network this episode was edited by Noah Bayshore who's also on Letterboxd uh, and produced by Tyler Smoy but thanks everyone bye bye bye